Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is in your part of the world. Uh, welcome. And uh, as some of you will know, this is the second time of trying. Uh, ironically, last week when I tried to do a webinar, live stream webinar on risk management, everything went wrong. Uh, <laughs> well, not everything, uh, but mainly the fact that our internet let us down. And I apologise to anyone who is uh, here for that, uh, but hope that some of you will have uh, rejoined. Uh, at the moment, looks like we've got about uh, about a dozen people on the stream, which is not quite as many as we had last time. I think we had about uh, 30 people uh, on the stream. So uh, it was really disappointing to be forced to disappoint you all, but I just couldn't make the stream work. However, uh, lessons learned. Um, so I've uh, had a look at the system. I think I found something which may have made things worse, which I have uh, disabled. But much more importantly, I have tethered my computer to my phone. And if things start to go wrong, uh, with a few clicks of the mouse, I should be able to uh, turn my uh, system from... Uh, preferring to use the uh, Ethernet connection through the Wi-Fi system, uh, through the uh, uh, broadband system, uh, to using the wireless connection to my phone uh, and therefore using my telephone uh, system. So I'm hoping that will work. Um, so before we uh, do anything else, let's just see who has said hello in the chat. Uh, first in was uh, Sultan Al Shadi. So uh, welcome uh, to you in Abu Dhabi. Um, and then we've got uh, Rich Mahoney, uh, who definitely was here last time. Uh, so uh, welcome back, Rich. Uh, it's good to have you there. And actually, I thought this last time, uh, you're kind of friend of the channel. And it's always good to have a few people who are friends of the channel uh, that I know uh, well uh, to uh, make you a moderator. Uh, so that uh, should you spot anything in the uh, chat which uh, you think doesn't belong there, uh, you and Patrick, uh, who is also here, uh, can actually just delete it. So we, I haven't. It's, I've had it once, and it hasn't happened very often. Uh, and it, it, where we've had some spammer uh, trying to promote something unsavoury. So if you spot anything you think really doesn't belong, uh, I trust uh, you, Rich and Patrick, uh, to take care of it. You can fight each other <laughs> over who gets there first. The other advantage it gives you is that you're able to post uh, links. Um, and I've just noticed Hambo Gumble come into the stream and Hambo has done that. Uh, he uh, seems to be very quick at getting useful links for the group uh, to answer people's questions. So uh, that's Rich, Patrick and Hambo uh, should all be uh, able to moderate. Uh, so who else have we got? So welcome, Patrick. Uh, uh, not a million miles away, I guess, from Rich uh, in uh, Western Pennsylvania. Uh, Patrick, I know he's on the East Coast. Uh, then we've got Ian Walters from Leighton Buzzard. You were here last week, I think. Uh, so I recognise that name. So that's good to see you there. Again, then we've got Vern Greenway uh, from Winnipeg in Canada. Uh, uh Everyone call your PM buddies. Not quite sure there. Uh, then EDR group. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, EDR, I think you posted uh, at the start of uh, the stream. Um, so I'm talking with the people from EDR about uh, getting involved in uh, their uh, project management academy. Uh, we'll see whether that plays out. If it does, I shall let everyone know. Uh, then what have we got? We've got, uh, I'm not sure whether it's Arsenio, Arquino, Arcinio, Jamal uh, from Mozambique. So got some Af good African representation. Uh, then Gabriel from Kazakhstan, though a Kenyan. Wow, I don't know whether we've had anyone uh, from uh, Kazakhstan before. Um, EDI is Mexico, uh, so that's, uh, that's Central America. Uh, haven't you got anyone yet got anyone from South America? Um, anyway, um, Another little a story um, and an unboxing. I think it's the first time I've done an unboxing uh, on the channel, but uh, I've actually opened it. So here is a padded um, uh, polystyrene box, um, and in it is the first sample of a mug which I will be selling. I don't think I'll have it available for Christmas because this is the sample, which is part of the risk management process. Um, some of you will recognize my periodic table of project management. I did a, a blog post uh, with that on 
uh, and uh, I thought it would make quite a nice gift. Um, but the sample arrived this evening, actually, about an hour ago in the post. Uh, came all the way from America. Not sure where. Uh, yes, I. No, actually, it seems to have come from the Netherlands, but. I thought I'd paid for shipping from America. From America, um, anyway, uh, it's a risk management process. Uh, basically, it's not for sale yet because I thought I'd order one and see how it looks. And I have discovered that um, because of the placing, I put a logo there, and then there's a the placing. Uh, I think the writing is a little bit too small to read, so I'm going to have another go. I'm going to make another one. I'm going to move the logo uh, into this slot here and, and make everything bigger. And hopefully, uh, the writing will be more legible. And it'll be a better product. I'll also possibly try and create an even bigger uh, file, but I think it's actually the uh, thing. But anyway, hopefully in the not too distant future, you will be able to buy a mug with the peer table of project management. So you'll be able to drink from uh, deeply from uh, the elements of project management. I also noticed in reviewing this that uh, trying to read the writing that actually there is an error, uh, a typo in there as well. So good. Uh, risk management there. Um, so for those of you who like the idea of drinking deep from the elements of project management, that will be available as soon as I can make it available, which basically means if the uh, tomorrow, if I recreate it and order it, it'll be with me, I guess, in about two weeks time that's taken. And um, so maybe for Christmas, maybe for Christmas. I will also, uh, once I've got that sorted, do a T-shirt as well. Um, the company offers male and female t-shirts, uh, men's and women's t-shirts. Um, I'll make them in dark blue with that logo on it. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to that. Oh, it looks like we've got a good number on the stream now, 27 people. Uh, so um, I won't do too much in the way of uh, advertising, but I will uh, just repeat uh, what I was saying last time. Uh, another thing that went wrong in my life uh, was that I created the book which was originally going to be called Shift Happens and then some American lawyers contacted me and said their client owned the rights to Shift Happens which I found very surprising on account of there were already 20 odd books on Amazon with that name but not wanting to be threatened by American lawyers I changed the name to Risk Happens published it and then published a second book with the same publisher called Smart to Wise my favorite book of all the books I've written and then uh, I did those within a year of each other. And then within about three weeks of this book coming out, um, the company stopped producing uh, paperbacks, uh, uh, business books and pulled out of that market and told me I had to either buy the 2000 copies they printed of each or they would pulp them. And so pulped they were. Um, so second edition of Risk Happens, which I'll be talking about in the seminar and brand new this is uh only been available on amazon for a couple of weeks but a nice hardback edition of smart to wise second edition so um, if you want to support the channel uh, one way to do that is to buy those books so i shall put the links in the chat uh, for those of you who uh, want to support the channel and get something uh, of a christmas present for yourselves or your loved ones nothing says i love you more than a book on risk management anyway uh, that's it. We've got a couple of people. Uh, no, it's just the influential PMO has joined as well uh, from the coldest kitchen in the Chilterns. Um, try turning on the heating. Uh, <laughs> so it's good to have Stuart from the influential PMO. Uh, fantastic channel. Uh, Stuart, um, slightly later to the game than me, but uh, has really got in now into um, artificial intelligence. Uh, so he, I, I imagine he'll be putting some more stuff on his channel uh, next year about uh, AI. Um, I think he's hooked up with a, a company. Uh, so uh, he does some really interesting stuff and has got a new course out as well um, for those of you who are looking to start a career in project management. So um, good luck with that, Stuart. Anyway, I'm not going to push my luck. Uh, I've got green across the board uh, on my uh, panel, which says uh, what the stream health is, which is brilliant. Uh, my uh, own system says uh, I'm, I'm green and so does YouTube. Uh, which tells me it's excellent. So I'm not going to push my luck. I'm going to go straight into the prepared seminar. Um, I will be uh, pausing every now and then just to see if there are any questions in the chat. So risk management is one of my passion topics. I'm really interested in it, uh, in project risk management. So if you have a question, I would be delighted uh, to answer it uh, if I can. Um, I'll have a swing at it anyway. Uh, so let's uh, cut across uh, to the... 
uh, slides and see if we can get things to work. Brilliant. Everything seems to be working. Fantastic. So we're going to talk about uh, risk management and I've divided the presentation up into four big chunks. I'm going to start off by answering the obvious questions. What is, what is risk and what is risk management? Um, clearly, if you know what risk is, management risk management is managing that risk. But we'll, we'll have a look at that won't take us very long, um, but we will then move on to the risk management process, the, the fundamental steps in managing risk. And uh, I use a simple four step process with a kind of loop. Then we'll go a bit more deeply into finding and analyzing the risks to your project. And I know that many, many people uh, have a default of brainstorming all the things that can go wrong. And that's their risk identification process, which is great. But I'm going to offer you uh, five more processes you can use, five more approaches you can use, which will help you to find more risks and to make it more fun for you and your team. We'll also look at <clears throat> how we analyze the risks uh, on our projects. And the three most important factors that go into risk analysis, and then we'll focus on the two big ones. Then we'll look at the all important strategies for managing them. I've got six risk management strategies for you. If anyone wants to debate some of the other strategies that are bouncing around there, like the, um, the late to the party seventh strategy that uh, PMI introduced in Pinbox 6, which I've never been sure about, uh, please please feel free. Um, and then um, I have a whole article about it. Um, and uh, we'll end up with the ways that risks can leave the system, if you like, uh, how we close out risks, the four different ways that risks can disappear from our system. So let's get started. So first of all, what are risk and risk management? And um, the picture that uh, you all saw advertising this webinar, or at least certainly the one for the first version of the webinar, but also the, the current version, um, has these two pictures on it. The uh, fizzing bomb, which is, to me, symbolises the Tom and Jerry cartoon that I grew up with, where uh, the mouse, Jerry, would hand the cat, Tom, this fizzing bomb, and Tom would just look at it and it would explode in his face. Um, and the dice, or die. So these are the solution to the question, what is risk? But really, fundamentally, risk management, to my mind, is all about this uh, Arab uh, proverb. I think it might be a Bedouin proverb. Put your trust in Allah, but tie your camel first. What that means is, the universe, Allah, God, whatever, um, isn't there to make your project go well. And you can trust in providence, you can trust in your planning, you can trust in your team, you can trust in your stakeholders. But you know what? The universe will at some point decide to poke you in the eye. So tie your camel uh, because things will go wrong. Things will happen that you cannot anticipate and so tying your camel is risk management so what is risk well risk fundamentally can be defined as uncertainty that can affect outcomes so the two key elements of risk are this uncertainty the fact that risks can occur they might occur what you cannot say is that they will occur or that they won't occur somewhere between zero and 100 percent likelihood where risks lie. There is doubt. And if a risk occurs, it will have an effect on your outcomes. If nothing happens at all as a result of something happen, uh, you know, something occurring, then it's not a risk. It's just, just happenstance. Yeah. Uh, so if something could happen, but you don't know uh, whether it will, and it can affect your outcomes, it's a risk. And that is an important thing to distinguish from issues. We talk about risks and issues, and I, like a large number of project managers, uh, choose to manage is risks and issues with the same tool set, the same process. I have a risk and issue register, uh, but you can have two separate registers if you choose. 
but the difference is that issues have a 100% likelihood. They are kind of like uh, risks, but they will affect your outcome. There is no doubt about an issue. The two broad categories, therefore, of issues are things that you know will happen and things that you know have happened. An issue, an issue either will happen, there is no longer any doubt about it, or it already has happened. That means that you have to deal with it. You are stuck, as this mouse is. There is no doubt about it. It has a problem. It has to deal with it. Uh, so that's the difference between risks and issues. And we're going to come back to that definition, uncertainty that can affect outcomes when we look at how we analyse our risks and measure them. But that leads us on nicely to the risk management process. And this is the kind of beating heart of everything. And the risk management process, as I see it, has four steps. The first step is to identify what the risks are, what can go wrong. You can't do anything. You can't manage a risk until you have an inkling that it exists. But you can come up with all these things that could go wrong. You then need to analyse them to understand those risks. Because without that understanding, you can't put together a plan for how you are going to deal with those risks. Oh, it's also worth saying, by the way, that we assume risks are a bad thing. But if I go back for a moment to this definition, uncertainty that can affect outcomes, I should have said this at this stage, this doesn't say that risks are a bad thing. Clearly, Mousy here uh, is facing a risk which would be a very bad thing, and many of the risks we face on projects are bad things. But we could have uncertainty that could have a positive, beneficial out effect on our outcomes. That, if you like, is an opportunity. A risk that has a negative effect on our outcomes is a threat. So threats and opportunities. And we need equally to be understanding things that could happen that could benefit us and put together plans for those as we do uh, for the things that we are probably going to be focusing on which is the threats the things that could go wrong um, and putting into place a plan for that and we'll see that depending on our analysis our plan needs to flex to be either a small simple plan for small simple risks all the way up to a big sophisticated plan for large scary uh, complex risks and then there is no change unless we act. And so it's no good having a plan. In fact, when I was uh, an active project manager running some large projects, one of the things that my firm, uh, which was a Deloitte Consulting, used to do was to get its senior experienced project managers to go and visit projects run by less experienced, less senior project managers to just check on how they're doing. And I remember sitting in front of a project manager I said, so um, tell me what you're doing to manage risks. And so he kind of grinned and passed across the table this beautiful risk register to me. And I glanced down at it. I could see it was beautiful. And I passed it back to him. And I said, thank you. Now, tell me what you're doing to manage risks. And he looked at me with that kind of look of sympathy in his eyes that clearly Mike hadn't understood that what he passed me was an immaculate risk register. So he passed it back and said, this is what I'm doing. And I looked at it and I said, that's a really nice risk register. Passed it back to him and said, so tell me what you're doing to manage risks. And at that point, the penny dropped. He said, oh, well, we haven't actually started doing any of these things. It is vitally important for project managers to develop a risk register and to keep it up to date. But the risk register is a tool. It is a tool for compliance, it is a tool for governance, and it is a tool for management. But if you do not use that tool to manage the risks and to actively work on those risks and to take action and to review that action, and that's the loop that I've just added in there, then the risk register is worth nothing. It is just a beautiful piece of paper or a beautiful spreadsheet or a beautiful database. So, that's the process we're going to follow. And having taken action, we're going to analyze the results of our action to see whether we have made enough difference to the risk to 
pause to stop or whether we need to understand what has and hasn't worked and then put together another plan and to take more action. And this cycle of analyze, plan, act, analyze, plan, act is the cycle of success, not just in risk management. It's very similar in stakeholder engagement. It's very similar in your life. If you want to be successful in life, step one, identify what you want. Step two, analyze how how far you have to go and in which direction you have to go to get it. Then step three, put together a plan for getting what you want. Step four, take action and then keep looping back. How am I doing against my plan? Do I need to amend my plan? Now I'll take more action. And that's how we become successful in anything in life. So just a little plug for this this book. Um, it's available on Amazon. Uh, either is a ebook or a print book, a paperback. Um, Risk happens. I think it is the perfect intermediary book between the really complex risk management books like Conroy, which is fantastic, and the simplistic approach that you get in most project management books, which you know, quite reasonably, because they've got to cover the whole of project management, and I've written one myself, uh, tends to occupy no more than a chapter. In a course, uh, like, you know, my um, skills mastery program, there might be three or four uh, lectures on risk management in amongst 80 or so lectures. Um, This book goes deeper, and it really does uh, help practicing project managers to understand a lot more about risk management, to give you more options. So how do we find risks on our project? Well, the standard approach is brainstorming. We all get together, we get our team together, and as project managers, we know that the the more diverse a group we can bring together, the more chances are we'll find more risks, which is brilliant. But of course, as the group gets bigger, brainstorming becomes less effective because the louder, more dominant voices will make themselves heard, and the quieter, shyer people will struggle to be heard. The people who speak first will perhaps dictate uh, or at least influence the way everyone else thinks. And so we can go down a number of kind of rabbit holes and miss out on a whole whole classes of of risks. So there are brainstorm is great for a small group of people. um, If you've got a lot of energy and a good facilitator, but it, it it is not ideal. Now there is a related approach which I think is much better called brain writing. It's like written brainstorming. Instead of having one shouting out what they think, everyone quietly thinks their ideas and puts each idea onto a separate card or piece of paper and puts that into a bowl in the middle of the table. And you can do this with a conference full of people. 200 people I've done this with. Um, uh, Every table has a bowl. And then at the end of a round of three, four, five minutes where people are furiously writing every idea they can think of onto a new card, you will end up with bowls on the tables with 20, 30, 40 cards. You can then shake them up and then swap the bowls over and then get people to dip into the bowl, pull out a card at random, put it back if it's theirs, but otherwise have a look at it. If that card spurs a new idea for another risk they hadn't thought of, they can write it on another card and put it in the bowl. However, they can also elaborate on the idea that's on the card uh, to add to the card, or they can even uh, you can even direct people to put their ideas for how we might manage that risk. So brain writing, much, much more powerful. And then as a second stage after that, you can then get people to cluster things and um, put the and group things and build up a picture of where there are overlaps and uh, similarities. My second technique is to call on the small number but very real group of people uh, in your organisation, in any organisation who have that risk mindset. And this is very much the way I operate in, in, in Uh, in that I will often see the risks in anything. I'll just think, oh, God, I can see that going wrong. Um, There are these kind of pessimists out there like me. Um, Sometimes they are really annoying and they say things like, oh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. If one of your colleagues says that, just sit them down in a chair and say, why not? What do you think will go wrong? And they will list all the things that they think will go wrong. And you should just sit there and write them all down. 
because some people are just wired into risk they just see all the things that could possibly go wrong and it's how they think so tap into those people they are they do it almost innately now the next approach is is really good for a group uh, but it also works well if you're having to do this on your own um, so let's imagine that you have to come up with a load of risks all on your own and you don't want to miss too much um, this horizon scanning process is like looking out to the horizon for the sources for the places the risks might come from um, some of you will have come across the uh, the pestle framework or the pester framework my specters framework specters of the things that can go wrong is related to that i've just added a couple of things and found a nice uh, happy <laughs> sounding uh, acronym stands for social risks sociological risks societal risks the things that can arise as a result of changes in society or the needs of society or the social interactions among people political risks now it's very easy to think uh, particularly in a world as we have today where things are changing fast in the political scene in many many countries there are big political upheavals and frankly wars in many countries it's easy to think of political risks as being capital p politics but actually i think of this as small p politics when you have two people in a room you have politics uh, so this is as much about uh, the internal politics of your project of your organization of your team of your group uh, of your function of your um of your business then there's economic risks and this this isn't just the economy which of course does mean that you know potentially if you're doing a large project you could be subject to interest rate changes you could be subject to foreign exchange rate changes uh, you could be in inflation could be a big economic risk but this is also about the small e economic risks as well have we got the funding uh, to do this project can we afford to develop the kind of quality that we really want to develop then there are commercial risks arising from uh, your ability to sell the products you make, your ability to compete in the marketplace, new entrants into the marketplace, the actions of competitors, the actions of suppliers, trading partners and all of that. There are technological risks. I know it's hard to believe in the 21st century that technology might ever go wrong. Uh, but believe me, I think I have some experience of this. There are such things as technological risks. Uh, then there are regulatory risks. So this is about the legislation and the regulation, um, both of your home country, uh, the jurisdiction within which your project is operating, sometimes supranational regulations and legislation. Um, I'm in the UK um, and some people are pleased, some are not, but we are no longer subject to EU regulation, but many countries are. If you're part of a trading block, there will be trading regulations that are supranational. But then there are also local regulations and uh, rules and policies within your organisation, right down to you know the health and safety rules. And then we've got the environment uh, and environmental risks. And again, this is not just uh, the fact that we're entering a massive El Nino uh, cycle uh, and we're going to probably have next year the one of the hottest years on record again um, after a year of massive drought of massive um, flooding we may well have a year of massive droughts but this is also again about the local environment there might be a funny smell coming from up the hall uh, there might be uh, not enough light in your office there might be a lot of noise coming from uh, the factory next door so don't just think about polar bears swimming to the Costa Brava for their holidays think about the local things and finally we've got security and I'd actually lump into this one safety as well um, and again this is physical security but this is also data security um, and all aspects of that and of safety as well so you can use this as a checklist for yourself but you can also when facilitating a conversation about risks say has anyone been we don't seem to have any risks here reflecting the commercial risks what commercial risks can you see what regulatory risks can you see and you don't have to divulge the fact that you've got these eight major sources of risks in your head because you've memorized the spectres framework now another technique i've i've borrowed i mean the pest pestle analysis comes i think from the world of strategic planning and strategic management so does the idea of the ishikawa technique or the fishbone diagram uh, 
which I've drawn here. But this is a fantastic way for taking a big amorphous thing that people will say is a risk. So let's say we're trying to um, sell a commercial property that our business owns, and that's that's either our project or a part of our project. And someone says, well, there's a risk that we cannot attract a buyer. Now, that is very, very hard to manage because it's big and it's amorphous. So what I like to do is to draw the fishbone diagram and say, well, what are the reasons why we may not attract a buyer? Because they're more like real risks that we can manage. And so examples might be, well, market conditions may be adverse and, and therefore we can't attract a buyer. Or maybe there are building constraints. The buyers that may want this building may not be able uh, under uh, building codes or regulations to, to make the changes they want. Or the condition of the building uh, may be very poor and that might affect our ability to attract a buyer. These feel like things we may be able to start to manage, but now we can take each one and break them down into more detailed things. So market conditions could be about availability of credit, uh, if uh, interest rates are sky high or something, or it may be about confidence uh, because by confidence, because the um, economy is turning down. Building constraints could be linked to planning conditions or it could be nothing to do with the local government and the legislation. It could be restrictive covenants within the lease or the, uh, or the, the legal arrangements around the property itself. The condition of the building could be things like the electrics or it could be contamination because it was used for um, materials processing or it could be that the roof is unsound as soon as you know that it might be the roof that's unsound you can start to build a plan for repairing a roof you can cost it you can look at the the level of uh, you can have a surveyor give you an estimate of how likely it is uh, to degrade within 10 years so these detailed fish bones give you specific risks that you can manage you cannot manage can't attract a buyer you know you have to manage the individual risks and now it feels like you've got loads more risks but every one of those is manageable let's not forget uh, uh, technique five um, that you may have data available to you and as career project managers we need to keep records of the projects we've done not just access our ever failing memories but we should be keeping records of the projects we've done the things that have happened and if as an organization you build up a database of every project and every risk that went onto the register and what actually happened after a time that's going to look like a fantastic resource now i've been saying that for years but in the last couple of years it started to become increasingly obvious that if you are putting that data onto a structured database tool like uh, power bi or whatever and then you're hooking up, hooking it up to artificial intelligence, then those learning programs are going to be able to not only make intelligent estimates of likelihoods, but they're going to be able to say, well, for this project, it's likely that these are going, these risks are going to be there. And whereas now, if you say to ChatGPT, tell me 25 risks that could happen on my software project, it will give you 25 generic risks on generic software projects. If it's working from your organization's database of having done 20, 30 projects in the past, that will be a phenomenal ability for, for that. And we know that there are software companies out there developing that dedicated software that will interrogate your own databases, your own proprietary data, and build patterns out of it. And that will be a fantastic resource for us as project managers. And finally, um, process, I call this process analysis, but the shrewder among you will say, well, hang on a minute, it's a bit like a word breakdown structure. And it is. It's a risk breakdown structure. So let's say um, I'm building a kitchen. And uh, if I want to refurbish my kitchen, I need to do the floor, the ceiling, the units and the walls. And each of those have things that could go wrong. So let's have a look at the units. And just as I would do with a work breakdown structure, I say, right, OK, well, I need to put in worktops, I need to put in the carcasses, the new, new units themselves, and the doors. And then from the worktop, well, there's the timber worktop, or it might be a plastic or a composite or a stone top or a steel top. Um, then I need the fixings that attach the worktop uh, to the carcass. Then I need the seals that seal it uh, and stop liquids going down the back. And then I need to insert a sink. And then those seals, they I need to make sure that they, they stick 
adhesion uh, and I need to make sure they will color match and I need to make sure I can get hold of them when I need them and those are my uh, immediately three risks connected to the seals will they stick properly uh, which is you would mitigate by choosing carefully a formulation that works with the materials you're using will the color match which you will mitigate by uh, trying samples out um, and can I get supplies which you will mitigate by ordering in good time so this kind of process analysis thing or tying in your risk break uh, your your risks to your work breakdown structure and for the bottom level of your work breakdown structure take everything at the bottom level of your work breakdown structure so what are the things that could go wrong with that and that gives you a risk breakdown structure so a good time to pause and see what uh, what's been happening in the chat uh, let's uh, let me just uh, take a chance and come back to the screen uh, what have we got uh, so uh, da, 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 da. we've got uh, influential PMO saying thank you for what I'm not sure but you're welcome uh, Sultan El Shadi grimace face uh, influential PMO it's amazing that many issues don't get dealt with absolutely um, <laughs> so you kind of I, I gave that uh, example of Tom and Jerry where Tom hands Jerry this fizzing bomb and he's, he's got this fizzing bomb in his hand and he looks at it and he stares at it now when I was working as a project manager actively so there was someone on my team called Nick and he was in uh, the territorial army he was a, a captain uh, in uh, a part of territorial army which deals with um, bomb disposal um, and for those of you who aren't British, territorial army is like our reserve army. So these are soldiers who are ordinary civilians during the week and at the weekend they go and give their time uh, to um, learn the skills of soldiering. And he was in, he, he said to me, look, you know, if you've got a bomb, you know, fizzing bomb with a fuse coming out of it. I know this is a mug. A uh, fuse coming out of it that is fizzing. He said, you know, there, there is a very simple way to uh, diffuse that, which is you lick your fingers like that and then you put out the fuse it hurts a little bit but if you just stare at that fuse then it will explode and if you've seen Tom and Jerry if you remember it when you were a kid Tom's face gets all blackened and his hair gets all frizzy um, so we don't want to do that um, so the longer you leave an issue the harder it will be to deal with it until it explodes in your face uh, Ed San says good afternoon from Rhode Island good afternoon uh, I'm not sure we've had any Rhode Island people uh, oh princess Aku at your service good evening from Accra Accra is that North Africa don't know do tell us uh, my geography is not great uh, Hamburg Gumble says a pessimist and optimist uh, with the facts yes uh, I've heard it the other way around actually an optimist is a pessimist who doesn't have all the facts so uh, we once again we're on we're on the same um, same wavelength Hamburg Gumble uh, Gabriel Connor says it it's again not live it's again not live it's again not live don't know what you mean by that I'm afraid uh, please do uh, clarify um, uh, Princess Aku just said yes I was right about Accra being in North Africa I'm not sure which country though so could you tell us um, and EDR uh, message was deleted okay uh, so sorry to have missed that um, uh, so I assume uh, Rich felt it wasn't appropriate. Um, uh, anyway, um, no questions in there, uh, so I'm going to move on. Uh, let's uh, uh, put that there. Uh, EDR, if uh, if Rich got it wrong, post again, um, and I'll have another look. Ghana. Oh, not quite North Africa. Is it North Africa? I thought Ghana. I would, would have guessed West Coast, but geography is not my thing. Right. So let's move on to analysing the risks on your project. And here they are again, the fizzing bomb and the dice, because those are the kind of beating heart of our risks. Remember, risk is uncertainty that can affect outcomes. And uncertainty is like dice dice can come up you know they're going to come up but you don't know what they're going to come up so uncertainty is measured with likelihood and the effect on outcomes is 
measured by the impact which I'm representing with my fizzing bomb. And for most project managers, that is all we ever have in our risk analysis. However, if you want to get one step more sophisticated, because there are a, a number of other things that we can build into our risk analysis, uh, the next most important thing, and it is relevant, is proximity, and in particular, proximity in terms of time. That is to say, we tend to give more importance, excuse me, to prioritize risks. If they're going to happen, they're going to happen sooner. So a risk that if it happens is, could happen next week, we will deal with quickly because there is urgency to it. If, on the other hand, if it happens, it will happen in two months' time. That's a, We can be a bit more relaxed about that. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen in 5, 10, 15 years' time. We tend to relax. Therein lies a big problem on the world stage because um, if you think about it, one of the most impactful, highest impact risks facing humankind. And without a doubt, a risk which is on the verge of becoming an issue. Well, no, it's, I think it is an issue now. Uh, but 15, 20, 30 years ago, it was definitely a risk, a possibility. Now I think it we're up there in the high 90%. Uh, is catastrophic global climate change. If we go past that one and a half degree, maybe up, go past the two centigrade centigrade um, increase in global temperatures, then we will see massive sea level rises. We will see huge numbers of people displaced from low lying coastal areas. We will see increasing rates of flooding, famine, fires, all those sorts of things which will displace people, which will cause huge problems with water supply, with food supply. Uh, and massive global inequities. If you think about that, if you say, well, you know, that, that's almost certainly going to happen, and that's, you know, that's going to affect millions, probably billions of people, um, possibly as many as one in eight, possibly even one in four of people in the world are going to be directly affected by this. Why is the world doing so little about it? Well, the answer is because all the projections are around 2050 which is still 25 years off. Although when people started projecting out 2050, they were 50 years off. Now, the other reason why that's a big problem, frankly, is democracy. I'm a big fan of democracy. I think it's the best system you can develop uh, for governing a country. But it has its flaws. And its flaws are that in a democratic system, we elect our leaders. And we do so uh, frequently, every four, five, six years. So if you're dependent on being elected in four, five, six years, your incentives as a leader are not to act uh, in the long term, but to act in the short term, to put in place policies which will come to fruition in a small number of years. So there's a bit of a problem with this. So proximity is a big one. Um, we should be taking it into account on our projects, but we shouldn't. It, it is a an emotional thing. It creates this emotional pressure on us. Um, and so if we can deal with the risks before they become urgent, then we can deal with them more rationally. There is, by the way, also another version of proximity, which is emotional proximity. Um, we consider risks as being more substantive if they deal with things that we care about. And related to that is geographic proximity. People are more worried about things that are happening in their community than they are in their wider country and they're more worried about things that happen in their country than uh, in their region and they're more, more about things that are happening in their region than are happening on the other side of the world. It's human nature. I'm not saying it's wrong, but it it's objectively not right either. So, Having mentioned and, and discussed proximity a bit, we're going to focus on the two big ones, impact and likelihood. These are the defining characteristics of risk. So let's start with how this chart works. We, we, we plot impact on one side. I tend to prefer to put impact on the vertical axis. Not everyone does. And likelihood on the horizontal axis. Some people reverse those. So as you go out uh, from the bottom left up to the top right, um, the risk is increasing. It's becoming more impactful, uh, bigger impact, and more likely. 
So clearly a risk in this top right hand corner, which is highly likely to occur. And if it does occur, it's going to have a big impact on what happens. That is a dread risk. And we're going to, when we look at the strategies for managing risk, we're going to say, you know what? It's not enough to build a plan using one strategy, um, uh, but we actually need to build a, a plan out of multiple strategies. So uh, I've just seen the chat. Let's see how we're doing. Uh, I think there's a question in there. Ah, oh, Ghana is West Africa. Good. Uh, Sultan says, how can we correct this concept? Oh, hang on, I missed. Uh, Acre is North Israel. Oh, OK, Acre is North Israel. Uh, Sultan says, why always risks are associated with HSE? HSE. In the UK, HSE is Health and Safety Executive, but I'm not sure what HSE is uh, as you mean it. Let me just uh, rapidly stick that into Google and see what it stands for. No, it's given me the HSE, Health and Safety Executive, HSE acronym. That's not worked. Let's see. Not getting there. Health and safety and environment. Oh, okay. Uh, right. Uh, what risks? Why are always risks associated with health, safety, and environment? Well, they're not always, but uh, those are always. There are always going to be health and safety risks on many projects. Although some projects, um, the, the most serious risks are probably paper cuts. Um, but. Uh, if you're, for example, working in a construction environment, massive health and safety risks in a, in a, in a factory environment, massive health and safety risks, uh, environmental risks. So I don't think um, risks are always associated with health and safety and the environment, uh, but they're all, they're always is the potential for them to be there. So I don't think we need to correct it. We just need to balance it up. So if you use the whole Spectres framework, Sultan, um, then you can make sure you get risks across the uh, things. Is there a list of known risks available on the internet to be used as a trigger for brainstorming writing? What a great question um, there. Let me just uh, go back. Well, first of all, I don't have one on the internet, but I do know there is one in here. Uh, it's about 120 odd standard uh, common risks that uh, do exactly that, uh, help you with your brainstorming. Um, Let's find it. Here we are. Uh, list of common risks. There we go. Uh, it's not really showing up very well. Um, it's also available in my uh, project management. I think it's checklists uh, toolkit. Um, but I don't know if there's a free one available. Uh, if you drop me a line in, um, then maybe I will send you a, a, a printout. Uh, Vern says, proximity, the nearest alligator to the boat. Heard it frequently in the Air Force. I love that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Infrastructure PMO got a drop out. Hopefully back soon. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, Rich, Mike, please reinstate the chat I removed. My apologies to everyone I misread and removed in error. Oh, I see. OK. Uh, right, let's see how we do that. Uh, so I'm guessing if I do that... I can't reinstate it, but I can read it. So EDR group said earthquakes or storms or hurricanes. Rain flooding uh, seems to start being increasing. Uh, these issues are to be considered strongly. Absolutely. You're absolutely right, EDR group. Um, I guess uh, we're thinking in the same way uh, on that one. Uh, we are seeing massive shifts in global uh, weather phenomena um, as a result of uh, global warming. Why is that? Well, as a physicist, I can tell you that basically as you heat up the oceans, uh, then you're dumping huge amounts of energy in the oceans. That energy can then feed into the weather system, um, which is why I think particularly things like hurricanes, ocean ocean based uh, weather systems uh, have much more power because there's a lot more energy stored in the oceans as they warm up. Uh, so um, there we go. I've just spotted something I didn't see. Uh, Neil Saw says spotting risks sometimes feels like a game of one upmanship with individuals trying to find ever more obscure risks. What sort of filter do you apply at the collection phase? Neil, that is a brilliant question. 
um, I have a story to tell. So first of all, my filter is I don't. I don't filter it. If someone thinks of it, it goes onto the risk register. The reason is because if the most bizarre risk somehow materializes and you haven't put it on a risk register and someone says, well, I raised that risk and Mike said, no, we're not putting it on a risk register. It's too weird. Then I have not acted with due diligence. Uh, I have dismissed an idea because I didn't think it was important enough. However, once it's on the risk register, we then work hard to um, estimate the likelihood. And it is perfectly reasonable to say we estimate the likelihood as being extremely low. And therefore, my decision as a project manager is to not do anything about it. And that's an entirely reasonable decision to make. We do that every day. Every organisation is doing it constantly with thousands and thousands of potential risks. And that's absolutely fine. If that risk materialises, people could argue that you didn't properly evaluate the likelihood. But if you did properly evaluate the likelihood and it was just a one in a thousand chance or one in a million chance, then you won't be uh, considered to have been um, in, in error in your process and therefore um, you, you won't have failed the organisation. Now, the, the, this actually happened not to me, but I remember stating that uh, at, uh, at a meeting uh, when I was leading a project with uh, a number of young uh, project management professionals, part of the team, uh, working their way up through the project profession. And uh, and I said, you know, everything goes on the list. We'll worry about the likelihood afterwards. We, we you know, now as someone's student, I say aliens land. Well, that's just testing me. And I will put down aliens land and then I will say likelihood, you know, as near to zero we and and it's not manageable risk we can't deal with it. um so one of those professionals um went on to lead a company and he contacted me uh and he told me the story that someone had put the server room floods and the server room was not on the ground floor it was higher up um and everyone said that no, that can't happen we shouldn't put that on the risk register and he said no it's going on the risk register and and it did and server room did flood. The fact that everyone had agreed that it was extremely unlikely and that we, there was nothing they needed to do meant that no, no one was actually at fault, but um, it shows that these extremely low likelihood things do occasionally happen. That's, that's life, that's nature. Hambo says, ask the question, what is the worst that can happen right now? Uh, yeah. Uh, yep, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, EDR Group, uh, have you heard about Acapulco Pot in Mexico with Hurricane Otis? The port is destroyed 100%. I guess it's Acapulco Port. Um, any plan worked out? Yeah, I mean, sometimes you get these once in a, you know, 100 year, once in a thousand year events. Um, the trouble is they're happening more often because we all our estimates of weather events are based on past history and we're changing the climate so fast. Um, yeah, what's the worst thing that can happen right now? Good question. Right, let's go back to the presentation. Oof. So, impact. There are lots of ways we can uh, estimate or measure impact. Um, the first question I always ask is actually, what do we care about? Do we care about money? more than anything else, in which case we could have an impact scale of, well, it could cost us hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars or even tens of millions of dollars. And by stepping up by orders of magnitude, factors of 10, you get a really good scale and you just need to pick kind of five levels which are appropriate to your project. If it's a small project, it might be tens of dollars, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. If it's a huge project, a major project, um, you might start off with thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions, possibly even start even higher and end up with hundreds of millions. If you care about reputation, then you might have a scale which says, well, at the bottom end, it might you might get a little bit of a, uh, uh, a, sh a short little article, tiny, you know, three or four lines in the local paper. Um, but it might escalate. It might be headlines in the local paper. It might be picked up by the national press. It might be on the front page of the national press it might be on the nine o'clock news um, day after day after day 
likes um what was that uh oil spill in the gulf of mexico um if you care about schedule then you could have a scale which is you know days of delay weeks of delay months of delay quarters of delay years of delay decades of delay in case of one or two mega projects however if you if you really don't have a, a preferred thing or you don't want to do multiple sometimes you will do multiple impact measurements i quite like this um, scale of action plan strategy objective goal which is actually how you address how would you need to address the impact of the risk is the impact small enough that a small corrective action would fix it or would you need to replan all or part of your project or would you need to throw out the whole plan and come up with a new strategy of how you're going to address the project or is the impact so severe that you there is no way you can plan your way out of it and one or more of your objectives will be compromised or is it so severe indeed that the whole project the goal of the project is not going to be achieved it's it's going to just you know ruin the project now the likelihood scale is, is much much harder because very few project managers have a deep and detailed understanding of probability theory and statistics and human intuition is very very poor over likelihood and so we, we get this massively wrong the only people who are really any good at this are actuaries who are trained in statistical theory and have access to huge amounts of data so my strong recommendation is you keep the likelihood scale very very simple you don't try and use clever words like possible probable likely highly likely um and you and you also don't try to use percentages because i quite often see you know people say well you know low likelihood is is less than 50 percent you know so 10 percent very low likelihood even one percent very low likelihood well frankly if there are a one percent chance you'd get hit by a car every time you cross the road you it would change your behaviors in the street because you cross the road 10 20 times a day you'd be hit by the end of the month um so one percent is not very low likelihood at all um in the context of things that you do very often so i, I hate seeing people try to put numbers against this um in simple projects and and frameworks with percentages i think are, are dreadful so keep it simple now once you've uh, analyzed your risk you need to build a plan and we build a plan out of six generic strategies i'm going to um i'm going to um, illustrate these by talking about car driving because car driving is one of the most dangerous things that most people do in their lives and the first and gold standard of risk strategies is to remove the risk entirely if you don't drive you will not crash your car so if you want to remove the risk of driving then don't take the car it's not to say that there aren't other risks being a pedestrian using public transport they all have risks but if you can find a a method that removes a risk entirely uh, that is the ideal the problem with most projects is that there are very few uh, ways that you can well, very few opportunities to completely remove a risk so we need to move down uh, the list to try other things and the next thing we do is to reduce the likelihood clearly if you drive less often you are less likely to have an accident also if you drive more slowly if you drive more carefully if you maintain your car well if you drive only when you are fresh and alert rather than late at night or under the influence of something you shouldn't be drinking or smoking then you are less likely to have an accident the next thing you can do is reduce the impact <clears throat> if you wear seat belts if you have an airbag or side impact protection if your car is robust and well maintained then when you have an accident you are less likely to get hurt the impact on you is likely to be less interestingly there is this human psychological thing uh, a kind of an element of conservation of risk people who have bigger more powerful cars with more safety features tend to feel less vulnerable and therefore tend to drive less carefully this is a massive generalization but statistics bear it out to a degree um, and therefore their likelihood of having an accident is slightly higher but of course they are not hurt it's the people on the other end of their massive vehicle 
The next thing you can do is have a contingency plan. This won't make it less likely that the accident happens, and it won't make the accident any less bad, but at least you will have ideas for what you can do to mitigate the impact after the event. Drivers tend to often carry things like uh, warning triangles, uh, fire extinguishers, high visibility jackets, first aid kits in their car these days, particularly in some jurisdictions where it's a legal requirement, of course. Uh, it's not a legal requirement here in the UK, uh, but I've got all those in my car, um, partly because I've taken the car to France where it is a legal requirement, but partly because, as I said, I am Mr. Pessimistic. I assume that at some point I am going to have an accident and need one of those things. And you know what? If I never need them, I'm not going to be thinking to myself, damn, I wish I hadn't spent that money. Um, which is kind of the attitude we have with the other thing that drivers do uh, to manage risk, which in the case of drivers is insurance. Now, insurance is a way of transferring a risk. I have the accident, but someone else has to pay the financial cost, bear the financial impact, the insurer. Now, I can't transfer the risk of, of getting hurt, but I can, again, insure uh, my health so that if I have an accident, I can be looked after by the health service. In the UK, we do that by paying our national insurance and getting a free health service. In other places, you buy health insurance and you have an accident and uh, you can afford uh, the insurer will pay for your uh, emergency care. On a project, on big projects, there are often insurance products. But the way that we transfer risks on most projects is through a contract. And of course, uh, insurance is just one particular form of contract. But when we work with a contractor, and we contract with another organisation to do a part of the project, what we're doing is we're saying, you can manage the risks of this better than we can in a more cost-effective manner. Therefore, we will pay you an amount of money. You will do the work at your own risk and if things go wrong if there are delays if there are problems you will have to bear the cost of that so a well drafted contract is a mechanism for transferring risk in a legally enforceable way so those are the first five of my six risk strategies but where i used to live there was a a, a young lad who lived uh, up the road from me and he absolutely adored driving it was you know something he really enjoyed so uh, as a result uh, this was not going to be his uh, strategy he didn't want to remove the risk he drove I would say like a complete and utter maniac being a young lad uh, so that clearly wasn't his strategy he wasn't out there to reduce likelihood of an accident and I often saw him driving without a seatbelt his car was also poorly maintained um, so I wouldn't be surprised if the brakes weren't great. The tyres never looked good. Um, so reducing the impact wasn't his strategy. He did at one point have an accident, and as we heard uh, later, uh, his only contingency plan was to get out of the car and run away from what then became the scene of the crime, because in the UK, if you leave your vehicle uh, after an accident, um, that becomes a crime. And he was driving underage. He was 16 at the time, therefore he wasn't able to get insurance. He wasn't even licensed. Uh, therefore, he wasn't transferring a risk. So what was his strategy? His strategy was to accept the risk. And the way I tell this story, it sounds like accepting the risk is something only a 16-year-old idiot would do. Um, but no, a perfectly competent, capable and highly professional project manager may accept the risk. It's just we do it in a different way. The 16-year-old idiot is going to say, I'm never going to have an accident, and if I do, I'm invincible. The experienced professional project manager is going to look at their analysis of the risk, and they're going to say, am I content that the likelihood and the impact are both sufficiently low and the cost effectiveness of any other option for managing the risk is just not good enough they're, they you know they're, they're just not uh value for money then i will determine that i will accept the risk and deal with it if it happens and we do this every day in our professional lives and we frankly we do it every day in our private lives as well when we get in the car yeah sure we won't drive a car when we want to go out for an evening and 
drink and have fun. Uh, but when we do get in the car, we will drive carefully to reduce the likelihood. We'll put on our seat belts to reduce the impact. We'll have some equipment in the car, or at least we'll have a phone with us. As a contingency plan, we'll have insurance. But you know what? There is always some residual risk, and we accept that residual risk as a reasonable price to pay for the convenience of driving a car. And as I say, when we're doing something as high likelihood and high impact as driving a car, we implement multiple risk strategies, and so we do on projects. Before I look at risk closure, let me just have a quick look and see if we've got any new comments. Have you any insight from insurance companies how they calculate risk? Well, yes. Uh, I mean, not direct, but um, basically the way insurance companies calculate risk is they work from vast amounts of statistics because unlike projects, which we know from PMI and others, sources are uh, unique events um, or at least rare events. We know that uh, insurance companies are dealing with things that happen every day. If you insure your life, uh, Ian, as a man of a particular age, I'm guessing you're a man, shouldn't really make that assumption from your name, but I'm okay, I'm a man of a certain age. Uh, the insurance company has records of thousands and thousands of men of my, of my age, um, with my lifestyle, and therefore they can make a good estimate of how long I'm likely to live. Likewise, they can look at my driving record, they can look at the driving records of men like me who drive cars similar to me who live in my area, they can look at the statistics, they can do some calculations, they can be fairly sure um, the likelihoods uh, and the impacts. So it is, and, and the, the name in, the, in uh, British English of the professionals that do that is actuaries, and they are some of the most highly trained mathematicians. Vern Greenway says, in aviation likelihood is estimated from regulatory perspectives, which use historic frequency of such things as engine failures, all based on numbers. Yeah, exactly as uh, the insurance industry does. And you can see that, you know, there are, if you take uh, commercial scheduled flights, passenger flights, there are thousands and thousands of them every day uh, with each class of air airliner aircraft um, and each airline is running thousands and thousands over the over the years so you can cross cut the data in multiple ways and if you are sophisticated enough with your maths and your ability to do multi-dimensional multivariate statistical analyses you can do that so um, I, I imagine uh, I would have imagined exactly what Vern describes Neil says, which of those strategies removes the risk from the risk register? Good question, Ver, uh, Neil. Uh, that's a, the perfect segue into risk closure because this is how do we, well, firstly, we never remove a risk from a risk register. We mark it as closed in some way because a risk register is, among other things, a document of record. It shows the story of your project and demonstrates that you've acted diligently. But the first way uh, we can take a risk out um, is we delete it. We don't delete it from the risk register, but we kind of conceptually put a line through it. We mark it as deleted. And this will happen. Let's just say that uh, uh, I put on the risk register the server room floods. And then someone says, mm, OK, uh, well, actually, that's really two risks. One is that the plumbing system fails and the server room floods. And the other is that there is a fire alarm and the sprinklers come on by in error. OK, that's two different risks. So we need to write up those risks. We will then mark the original risk as deleted. We will not remove it from a risk register. We will not reuse its risk ID. Um, and then in the narrative to it, we will point to the two new risks that have been raised in its place. So that's the first way, uh, Neil, that we uh, take a risk not off the risk register, but uh, away from our attention on the risk register. The second thing is that we might mark a risk with uh, all sorts of actions that need to be taken um, in order to render the risk no longer uh, a concern. And when we've taken those actions, we've marked all the actions complete, we now consider the risk is no longer uh, can happen, um, then it is completed. And again, we mark it as completed, not deleted, and we no longer concern and but with the use of filters and sorting and all the things you can do on spreadsheets and databases um, we need never see that risk again but it sits there on the record um, for all time um, and therefore as part of the audit trail 
Third thing is it's outdated. Let's say I raise the risk. We're, we're building a, a new building. And one of the key steps, of course, is to pour all the cement uh, for the foundations. And we raise the risk that uh, the cement may not set properly for multiple reasons. There are probably uh, many different uh, elements of that risk it may be that the com formulation of the concrete is is incorrect it may be that it's poured too late or poured too soon and not not mixed properly it may be that there are adverse weather conditions humidity is wrong temperature is wrong and it doesn't set properly but once we have had the engineers in uh, to test the concrete and to certify that it is uh, fit for purpose and we can now build the next level that risk is now outdated uh, it is no longer a threat to the project again we never need never see it and then of course that's the last one the risk has occurred uh, now sometimes the risk can occur we fix it and then it could still be another risk so we need to put it back on the risk register but sometimes uh, but that original version of it uh, comes off so those are the four ways we close the risk so i um hope that means uh yes so neil uh, asks the question completed means residual risk equals zero yes uh but of course remember risk is a combination of likelihood impact and arguably proximity as well um but yeah effectively we're saying it can no longer happen um its likelihood is zero you could argue that it could still happen but it no longer will have any effect no longer have any impact um, hard to think of an example but there may be one um, some can think of one pop it, in, pop it into the uh, chat it's rather like uh, in principle you can have four types of dependencies you can have finish to start which is the commonest you can have uh, finish to finish uh, and start to start you could in principle have uh, start to finish dependencies but it's pretty hot to think of a legitimate example of that uh, Sultan Al Shadi says uh, we're using the concept of reduce the risk as low as reasonably acceptable in our company. Yes, exactly. Um, by saying you reduce the risk as low as reasonably acceptable, it, it means that actually to get it any lower will cost a disproportionate amount of money uh, or a disproportionate amount of resource or disruption. Therefore, the cost of further reduction is far greater than the the benefit of reducing it further so you, you it would be cheaper to incur the residual risk and <coughs> there are a um, a number of ways of calculating a value to a risk which fundamentally are based on multiplying the likelihood with by the um, by the impact they are deeply flawed um, I have to say uh, I don't I don't like it but uh, yeah it uh, uh, some people use that methodology last thing I want to say is no stopping uh, risk management doesn't stop you should be periodically reviewing all the risks on your risk register on some projects I would do that every day I would look I would use the filters on the risk register and look for uh, risks that uh, had not been updated uh, in the last uh, week or two or I would look for uh, risk owners that I hadn't spoken to in the last week or two and I'd do some filter of the risk register and then follow up a number of risks every single day and you keep going and then periodically you'll get your team together or a part of your team together and you'll say what new risks are there that we haven't got on the risk register that have emerged that we uh, we haven't been thinking about so we need constantly to be addressing uh, our risks and working working the risk management problem so one last plug for the book but I'm not gonna uh, do it and then I'm gonna say thank you all very much uh, let's come back to me we've got through the whole stream and I have never noticed the stream being anything other than excellent condition big tick uh, and I'm not I'm not 100% sure but uh, I think it's all been going through our broadband so uh, thank you broadband uh, with the phone sitting there as my insurance policy uh, unused hopefully I'll probably find I've got a massive data bill now um, so no other questions but please do uh, ask some last questions uh, whilst I do one last plug for Christmas gifts uh, smart to wise 
risk happens, uh, any of my books, frankly. Um, watch out. If it becomes available for Christmas, I'll be plugging my uh, periodic table of project management mugs and T-shirts that I'm creating. Um, so I'm crossing my fingers that we might be able to get those done before Christmas. Um, and talk about before Christmas, there will be one more live stream this year, uh, which... Uh, will be on the 5th of December, which is the first Tuesday in December, back to first Tuesdays. Hopefully we can uh, have that as smooth as this one. Um, uh, with uh, um, uh, a nice good attendance. I think we kind of peaked out at uh, about 35 people, which is great. Um, and that will be about project leadership. And that will be the last of this series of four uh not scripted I don't script anything uh, for planned prepared uh, webinar type live streams um, so if you remember we've done um, uh, kind of staying healthy as a project manager stress management all that we did one on uh, stakeholder engagement this one's been on risk next one will be on project leadership and I'll be looking at what is the distinction between project leadership and project management so uh, that will be on the 5th of December. I hope to see you there. Um, if there are any questions, please do ask them now. Otherwise, I'm going to wrap up the stream and let you get back to your lives. Thank you all very much for attending. Um, and uh, if you want or need to contact me, you all know how to do that. Um, get in touch with me via the website, onlinepmcourses.com. If you want to know more about risk management, then there is of course, a risk management playlist here on YouTube. Patrick says, God, God session, Mike. Um, I'm going to assume you meant good session. I don't think it was quite a God level session. Uh, but uh, thank you very much, Patrick. <laughs> uh, so this is my risk management playlist on YouTube. And I have a lot of articles as well as the versions of the videos on the website. So if you're more of a reader uh, than a viewer, uh, or you want to read some of those, including my article, which explains the different uh, risk strategies uh, that other organisations have added to the list uh, and why I don't think they're uh, uh, relevant. Um, can we do a session on earn value management? Uh, Sultan asks. Uh, no, <laughs> I just don't think it would be popular. Enough. But I have got uh, videos about uh, I have got a video about earn value management uh, and I've got a full article. Let me find the full article for you. Um, uh, Sultan, so you could, because uh, I think it's 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 one of those things. that's a lot more uh, easy to do uh, in writing. Um, I'm not an expert in EVM. I'll be uh, absolutely honest about uh, that. Um, <coughs> um, so I've got a what is earned value management video, which is very 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 basic. But if you want to kind of uh, learn your way through the maths a bit. Um, there's a link there. Uh, and I also did one on um, yeah, I'm trying to remember. There, there was one that uh, looked at the different ways of calculating uh, cost to complete or cost to completion. Let me see if I can find that for you. Here you are. What is estimate at complete? So there's a video on YouTube. Uh, and I will just get you the link to that. Um, because people get really confused about estimate at completion. And the reason they get com um, confused about it is because there are actually different ways to calculate it, depending on the assumptions that you're making. So uh, take a look at that link that I've just pasted in there as well, uh, Sultan. Uh, Patrick says good session thank you uh, Rich says thank you uh, thank you uh, Ian says thank you thank you you're, <laughs> you're all very welcome uh, great job MC says Vern uh, EDR group thank you Mike super interesting as always a lot of value uh, my pleasure it really is my pleasure I enjoy doing these when they go well it's very 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 stressful when they don't um, but I think I have a process now so thank you all for your time uh, thank you all for your support could we exchange t-shirts I could send you one and you could send me one I like the orange one. I like the orange one. I'm not going to be doing an orange one. Oh, you mean the ones that where uh, in the videos? Uh, no, uh, I'm not going to be making those. 
<laughs> don't want people impersonating me. Uh, so yeah, when I do the videos, the main videos uh, for the channel, I have seven, I think now, uh, polo shirts, all with the uh, logo embroidered on it. Um, the reason was because I was getting sick and tired of pulling shirts out of trying to decide what shirt to wear of a video, uh, and then wondering whether it would alias uh, in the camera and cause all sorts of weirdy problems. And I like, I think it was Barack Obama I first heard, uh, lots of people do it, has said basically he has a number of suits and they're all pretty much the same colour, same design. Uh, so he can just pull one out of the cupboard and not worry about uh, what suit he's going to wear. Um, and that just removes one decision and one piece of stress from his life. And I just thought, is that what a brilliant idea? I'll just get branded t-shirts, but I'll get them all different colours, but I won't worry about which colour I wear. I'll just kind of uh, put them in a random order and then record a couple of few videos um, and change change shirt between videos. Uh, so occasionally you'll see two videos back to back uh, with the same shirt, but not very often. <laughs> um, but I'm not planning to produce those. Uh, what else? Uh, take care all, says Hambo. Take care, Hambo. Uh, thank you, says Ella Kumo. Uh, weren't, weren't aware you were there, but uh, you're welcome. And Sunil says, looking forward to more webinars. So, yeah, me too. Okay, I'm going to assume now that there is nothing more that anyone uh, needs to say. So I will say, signing off, uh, have a good rest of the month, and I will see you in, I think, three weeks' time. Take care. Bye now.